great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with a sinner's heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. So remain. clap offering for his grace. Oh, Father. You know, Lord, I just want you to know that I know that apart from your grace, I'd never make it. You are a merciful God, loving and kind, gentle and patient, forgiving to the nth degree, and we thank you for all of that. And Lord, we never want to take advantage of that. We, we don't want to take advantage of your grace. Lord, we want to live in a way that is pleasing to you. But Lord, we do thank you for those moments when we falter, when those moments when we fell, that, that safety net of your grace, because we can never fall out of your favor. We can never fall out of your blessing. Oh, you correct, and some of us have been corrected this week. But you love us, and we thank you for that. And we would just ask as we start the service this morning that we could set aside the barbecues that are going to happen later today. You know, probably thinking about ribs and ribeye, and we can't think about that right now, Lord, because we want to think about you. We want to set our hearts on you this morning. And so, Father, fill this place with your presence this morning, we pray. 
as we seek to worship you, Father, not just from our lips, but from our hearts this morning in Jesus' name. And all God's sons and daughters would say, Amen. 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 Remain standing with me, please. Lift up my voice. Lift up my voice to the King, the King of glory. I hold out my hands to the one who is worthy. come it's father's day and we celebrate that for one another here but lord we want to celebrate that as we do every sunday with you you are our our heavenly father and we come to celebrate you you've done more for us than all human fathers combined And there's none like you. And so, Lord, we just just want to bless you this morning with the fruit of our lips and the love in our hearts, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues 
above, praise his name, I'm fixed upon it, name of thy redeeming love, hitherto, hitherto thy love has blessed me, thou hast brought me to this place, and I know safely home by thy good grace. Teach the some man, stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, bought me with his precious blood. Oh, to grace, oh, to grace. How great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a feather, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Here's my heart, here's my heart. Here's my heart. my heart here's my heart oh take and seal it seal it for thy courts Jesus, Lord of heaven, I do not deserve the grace that you have given and the promise of your word. Lord, I stand in wonder of the sacrifice you've made with mercy beyond measure my debt you freely made your love is deeper Lord of heaven, oh, I do not deserve the grace that you have given and the promise of your word. Lord, I stand in wonder of the sacrifice you made with mercy beyond measure my debt you freely pay oh lord your love is deeper than any ocean stars 
in the sky. Your love is deep, your love is wide. Your love is deep, your love is wide, your love is great, your love is high, your love is calling out to me, your love is all I ever need. Your love is deep, your love is wide, your love is great, your love is high, your love is calling out to me, your love is all I ever need. Cause your love is deeper. in the sky Your love is deeper than any ocean higher than the heavens reaches beyond the stars in the sky Jesus, your love Jesus, your love has no bounds. Jesus, your love has no bounds. Jesus, Jesus, your love has no bounds. Jesus, your love has no bounds. I love to sing that about you. Your love has no bounds. Your Lord, you're such a good, good Father. Even at our very best, we as human fathers and mothers, Lord, our love can falter sometimes. And we're just human, we're not perfect, but Lord, your love knows no bounds because you are perfect. And we just want to bask in your love, your grace, and your mercy. stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. You're perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. You are perfect. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect. 
perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. Oh, it's love so undeniable. I, I can hardly speak. Be so still as you call me, deeper still into love, 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 you're a good, good father, it's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you, it's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. Father, it's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you, it's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am.
Father, when we think about that, and I think about it a lot, because I, I didn't just get saved, I got rescued, redeemed, plucked from the fire of hell, Lord, and I thank you for that again today. Lord, you know the needs of the fellowship this morning, you know each and every one of us, you know each and everything that we're going through. Lord, this morning, you know if it's financial, you know if it's physical, you know if it's emotional, you know if it's spiritual. You know if it's marital or relational. Lord, you know what we are struggling with right now in our hearts. Because everything is exposed before you, Lord. Nothing is hidden. And Lord, as we come this morning and we lift these things to you, each and every one of us saying, Lord, this is what I have need of. This is what I'm going through. This is the struggle. This is the difficulty. Maybe the difficulty this morning is learning how to forgive yourself. Maybe the struggle this morning is learning how to forgive others. Whatever the struggle may be, Lord, this morning, we bring it to you. Because, Lord, we know one thing, that we cannot change our hearts, only you can. But what we can do is we can change our minds. And in changing our minds, we can bring our hearts to you, and we can ask, Father, that you would change our heart, that you would minister in those areas of our life that we need ministering in. That, Lord, those areas we need healing in, you would heal, Father. Those areas that we need provision and protection in, Lord, you would do that. And so we lift these things to you this morning. We do trust in you, Father. We're going to leave these things with you. We're not taking them with us when we leave here. We're going to leave them right here on the altar. And we're going to ask that you would just deal with them, each and every one, whatever they may be. And we pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's kids would say, Amen. Well, you know the drill. Let's spend a few moments fellowshipping with one another before you find your places. You know, every day is Father's Day for us as believers, is it not? As we honor our Father, the one who not only created us, but those of us that are born again gave us spiritual birth as well. Amen? But today we want to honor the earthly fathers. And so... Uh, as much as we possibly can. So if you're a father this morning, would you please stand? Yes. Now we're going to do a very special thing this morning. Yes. Hey, we're going to do a very special thing this morning. We did it a couple Wednesday nights ago as we're working our way through Malachi, and we were teaching on the responsibility of the husband and of the father uh, to be the high priest of his home, the one who dispenses truth and, and you know, leads and guides in spiritual things. He is the spiritual overseer of the home, is he not? But he's also the provider, the protector. He's got a lot of weight on his shoulders. Would you not agree? So I'm going to have you wives stand and put your arms around your husbands because we're going to pray for them and the fathers. Yes. You ladies didn't think you were going to get involved today, did you? You thought like on Mother's Day we were just going to stand you up and honor you, but no, 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 no. You get to pray because the Bible says pray for leaders, correct? And your husband's the leader of your home, or ought to be. Is that not true? So I want to see every wife have her arm around her husband. And if you don't, you're coming in for counseling. Because <laughs> you need it. Everybody got their arms around them? I'm looking. I'm not praying until you do. Some are hugging. That's a good thing. Don't get carried away. Sister, you're in church. <laughs> you're in church, Keith. Come on. You're in your life. But that's okay. I see you back there, Ruski. 
But you know, listen, in the day and time we're living in, you men have a huge responsibility. There's a tremendous weight that God has placed on you. It's a mantle from the Lord. And I just want to pray that you could stand up and be that man in the times we're living in. Love your wife like Christ loved the church. Train up your children in the way they should go because when they grow old, they won't depart. You listen, I like what, what Mark Twain says. When they turn 13, put them in a pickle barrel and feed them through the hole. Uh, when they turn 16, just plug the hole. No, 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 no. Your job is, even to those teenagers, I'm so glad that we're on grandchildren now. We're, no, we're past the teenagers, and we lived through it, and so did they. And we got them safely married on the other side, and they're all serving the Lord. But now we're, we're working on our grandchildren. We have some wonderful ones. So let's pray for you, husbands, you fathers, you leaders. Father, we just lift these men before you this morning. And Lord, we pray for their wives, that they would be a source of encouragement. You created them, Father, and one of the, the tasks that you laid upon the wives is to be the helpmeet. Lord, you said back in Genesis, it's not good that man should live alone. And Lord, we agree. You made a helpmeet equal to us, to encourage us, to come alongside us, to comfort us, Lord, because you knew the weight that would be upon us as men, as husbands and fathers. You knew the weight of spiritual authority that rested upon our shoulders. And Lord, you knew that one day we'd have to give an account for it before you, how we led our families, how we loved our wives. And so I pray for these men this morning. We want to honor them. We want to thank you for them. We want, Lord, that you would bless them today and bless them every day. And we just pray, Father, that you, Lord, would exceedingly abundantly above give them all that they could ask or think in the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's men would say, Amen. all God's wives and daughters would say, Amen. Amen. Okay, you can be seated. Give the guys a round of applause one more time. They work hard, man. I have, uh, I have three announcements. Um, one of them is extremely important. Moses is in the house. So Gene Howerton, would you stand up? He's 91 years old today. Where is Gene? God bless you, brother. You know, up until recently, he did our rest home ministry. And I don't know how many people he's led to the Lord in the last number of years. And we just want to honor you, man. I think you are Moses. Now, one of these times I want to sit down with you because I want to know how the ark was built. <laughs> and I want to get accurate measurements because I know you were there, so you could probably inform me about that so that when I'm teaching through that section of the Bible, I can get it right. Amen? Amen. Well, we love you, Gene. Hey, don't forget yard sale, the 28th and 29th of uh, June here at the church. And, whoa, no, let's see. Is that right? Okay, that's the 28th and 20th, because it got postponed, right? Okay, yard sale here at the church. If you have any questions, see Donna. Don't forget Youth Camp is coming up July the 11th through the 14th. If you can sponsor one of the kids, we have several children going, or children, kids, teenagers, that parents are not even saved, and so they need full sponsorships. So if you could do that, would you please see one of the youth pastors, or you can see me or Pastor Todd. Pastor Todd will take your money, I guarantee you. So if you could see Pastor Todd about that so we can make sure that all the kids are supported. Amen. Hey, we have a special treat here on Father's Day. This man has been influential in my life. He's a pastor's pastor. And we've done outreaches from Nevada to Philadelphia back in, you know, uh, the East Coast, planted churches, served with him. He's asked me to serve on his outreach board, and I will. Somebody's got to keep him accountable. But would you give a big round of applause to Pastor Rogers. He come up and brings the word this morning. How's that? <laughs> Pastor Mike, you're so nice this morning. He didn't tell the whole truth about me. That was wonderful. Well, it'd take me a, a lot of repenting if he did, but uh, so glad to 
have the privilege. Yeah, we've been trying to get together with how many over a year? So we're trying to hang out together a little bit. And right, How many years ago was it we were here before? About 13. 13 years ago. We did an outreach here and to revive, you know, Grass Valley. And, and then we ended up in Nevada City and got really baptized in, in that particular city. It was wild, boy, I tell you. But it's uh, been a great, great time to be able to come back and hang out to, with him. And then see Todd, you know, Todd played football for me back in Anaheim High School and those years. And he was making up wild stories to tell Pastor Mike yesterday, like 700 stadiums or something like that. I think there was a maximum was 100, I thought. Was it really 700? Is that the truth? That sets you free. How is it truth? Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, we had a great time together. Uh, we used to take Todd to, to church, you know, years ago, and he and my daughter would fight in the back seat of the camper that we would take him in, and uh, it was, they both survived it and everything. But anyway, good to be here. Well, Lord, we just stop for this moment of time to give you thanks. Uh, it is always a, a blessing to be able to talk about you and to talk about your word, and there is so much uh, as we go down this road uh, in preparation for your coming. We can see it all around us. And yet you have called us to take those strong stands, like salmon going upstream and not goes downstream like the world is going. So, Lord, we ask that you would help us take your word to heart and that we would stand on your word, that we would be absolutely set free because of the word of God and because of you, Jesus, giving that sacrifice for us on the cross. And to that we give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, one of the things that I'm going to talk about a little bit is today about the mystery of Christ in the church. But in Psalms, actually, 11.3, it says, If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And the foundation is this, uh, was this country was built upon the rock, upon Jesus Christ. And I know that there was times where people say, well, it's no longer a Christian nation. I'm so sorry. We're still here, and it's still a Christian nation. So we take a stand. But it's the Christians that have to take the stand. But yet the enemy, the enemy goes after the church. When you begin to go all the way back to Genesis, when he made them male and female, first of all, he created them. So what happens? Satan goes after and tries to destroy the babies in the womb. Just get rid of them. Because it's something that God made. It's an absolute attack of Satan is what it is. Not only that, you move a little bit further, male and female. He didn't say that he made homosexuals. He made them male and female, not transsexuals. He made them males and female. So what happens is Satan comes in and twists people's minds and to take away an affront to God for who he is. And then he talks about marriages, that they represent the mystery of Christ and the church. And what does Satan go after? He goes after those marriages. You know, when God puts people together, then from that point on, he works and works and works for an opportune time to try to destroy that marriage. That's why foundations have to be strong. See, in the power of his might, it has to be strong in him. And if Jesus is not the glue that holds it all together, guess what? It all falls apart, and that's what's beginning to happen. So I thank God for you guys. I thank God for all that goes on in this particular church and the testimony that goes out. Phenomenal works of God. Because your pastor is committed, your pastor's wife is committed, your pastors here are committed. And it's a healthy church. I hear good reports. I know it's a healthy church. And so I thank God for the ministry that's taking place here today. But meanwhile, as I lay that out before you today, uh, I want you to turn with me, if you will, to, uh, how about the book of Ephesians? Chapter 1, actually. We'll start off there. One thing about the book of Ephesians that I found, it's kind of unique. Oftentimes they'll talk about marriage in the book of Ephesians, or they'll talk about warfare in the middle of the... But you know, all those are components, but those components don't make a lot of sense unless you take the book in itself and complete, you know, thoughtfully. You take, the, you take a look at the first three chapters of the, of the book of Ephesians, and it lays a foundation, a strong foundation in all that God has done for you. He's given you every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. He's given you the sealing of the Holy Spirit upon your life. He, he, he died for you. He rose again from the dead. He gave you everything. 
And once you know what God has done for you, you cannot help but live for him. If you don't know what God's done for you, then you're missing out of a component that the rest of the book does not make an awful lot of sense. Because as soon as the foundations are laid, you begin your walk in the Lord. And many of us have been walking for the Lord for a while. And in that walk with the Lord, it begins to see certain aspects happening. He lays it all out, what that walk is all about, and how we should live a life. Because Paul you know, experienced Jesus on that road to Damascus. He experienced Jesus' love, and he didn't deserve it. They're going to hell, and Jesus loved him enough, saved him, and they called him to be that pastor or that you know, apostle to the Gentiles. What tremendous love that God gave him. And that love, he sits in the jail, and he writes this letter talking about this church at Ephesus that he lays it all out how important it is that their walk be what it should be and how they're going to represent the Lord because that culture at Ephesus was just like the culture we have today. Exactly. And he begins to address the church, reminding them what they are to do when they walk. So in the book of Ephesians, actually in chapter 2, one of the things that really um, reminds me, he says, and you, in verse 1, you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, <laughs> which you once walked according to the course of this world. I mean, you were once dead. He made alive. Sometimes it's hard for me to walk around and see these Christians, they go, you know, kind of all oh, depressed. You know, is the class half filled with, or is it half empty? Or, oh, it's mostly half empty. Woe is me, you know. Come on, he made us alive. Why? Because Jesus Christ, when you got born again, Jesus came inside of your life. Unfortunately, what begins to happen is the church begins to think of it being a religion. I go to church, I got to do my duties, you know. No, no. What about the relationship of Christ being in each one of us? And we're in him, we are connected. We have Jesus living. We have God himself living inside of us. How can we ever be deadbeats if he is alive inside of us? Because we were dead once. We used to be dead in sin, but no longer. For whom the Son sets free is free indeed. He set us free. We sang about that this morning. We talked about grace after grace after grace this morning. That unmerited favor of God that we didn't even, couldn't even earn it, but God gave it to you because he loved you. He goes on in chapter 2 and begins to talk a little bit about he's our peace. He, you know, he brought us nearby his blood. He becomes a cornerstone. He goes on in chapter 3 and deals with issues of mercy and, and, and mystery. And then in chapter 4, he begins to talk a little bit more about the, to walk that walk worthy. That we were called with all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love. There's one body... In one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. He's not talking about being from Oklahoma, by the way, uh, in you all. So he says, he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, in verse number 11, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. Jesus Christ came to this earth to love mankind, to give his life fully for all of us, the whole world. I ran into a gal this morning, and I said, you know, I said, Jesus loves you. And at the receptionist at the hotel, she said, well, he loves everybody. I said, well, that's true. But did you love him? And she came back, yes, I do. I said, man, you're a believer, huh? You know, one of the things that happens is Christ in us is the hope of glory, but we're in him in this union to be able to walk with God worthy of that calling that he has for you. Every one of us in this room has been given a gift, Holy Spirit gift, at least one, to be able to carry out the work. And it's distributed equally all over. Now, we're, we're not all the same in necessarily in, in, of what the gifts are, but we're all in the same in Christ because we all have something to be connected with. But nevertheless, we move forward a little bit further, talking about the, the chapter 5 of, and talking about be imitators of God and walk in love and, and then talking about walking in the light. And then I'm going to move into an area that you're well versed with. That's beginning with chapter 5, chapter 22. 
In Ephesians chapter 5, he begins to lay out something kind of unique about marriage. Why would he throw marriage right in the middle of the walk? I don't even know. I can't figure that one out. Except he took marriage, and he talked about marriage being the same as the union in relationship with Jesus Christ. There's no difference between a marriage and the union of our walk with him in the Lord. And he uses this analogy to prepare, you know, the church for the next chapter, talking about their children and then also talking about spiritual warfare. And when you're in the middle of warfare, you go back to chapters 1, 2, and 3, and then you, get the, you continue to walk. If you're going to go walking, you're going to go through warfare. And when you go through warfare, you go back to chapter 1, 2, and 3 and be able to remind ourselves of the foundation we have, the walk that we have, and the purpose. But then going back to this principle called marriage today, I want to talk a little bit about that because it is unique. One of the things that happened years ago, uh, my wife and I were running a, a, a marriage ministry at Calvary Chapel South Bay, and we, it was a phenomenal work of God. We had people uh, that were, it was a really a mixed up group of, of, of a home Bible study, and uh, we had uh, a divorced couple there, and they made a recommitment to their lives to the Lord. He became a pastor. There was another guy there that they had filed for divorce, and uh, uh, they were there. They, they gave their lives to Christ and got put him back in the ministry, and he's a pastor up in Oregon. Uh, there was a couple there that couldn't have any children, and she conceived. There was a guy who was a macho guy who abused his wife, and he was serving breakfast for her in bed, and that went through the whole church like crazy. And I go, whoa, whoa, <laughs> that is really too much. And so my wife and I were on our way home from the Bible study right cl near the closure of those weeks. And all of a sudden, traveling down the 91 freeway, I saw some cars kind of moving over to the side of the road. And I'm wondering, what in the world is, is going on here? And meanwhile, ran right into a car going 60 miles an hour. Uh, this gal had diagonally parked her car on the freeway, turned off her lights, and ran across the freeway. And I ran into her. Cindy went through the windshield. I pulled her out. I thought she was dead. I pulled her out, and I thought, Lord, I know she's in a better place with you, but what about me? What, what would I do without my wife? Man, I, oh, man, what a shockwave. And all of a sudden, she came alive, and we went in the ambulance. I went in the ambulance. It was the hottest date I ever had in my whole life on the way to the hospital. And I never forgot that day of what my wife really meant to me. You never know what your wives mean to you or your husbands mean to you until those days when you begin to lose them. You know, we have an opportunity to live every day as if it was our last, to be able to be a blessing. And that's why I want to bring it today. Even though I'm going to talk about marriage, it kind of combines itself with bringing Mother's Day back in and then Father's Day back in and, and focusing on the blessing that Pastor Mike did as he prayed for you fathers. But I really think it's so crucial that we begin to look real clear at what God wants to do. And it's one of those things when you begin to talk about uh, this uh, principle of, of, uh, of marriage as it's laid out. He goes, first of all, if you move up a little bit, he says, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all thanks to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of love. And then he goes on down, wives, submit to your own husbands as unto the Lord. You know, it's really an amazing thing when we talk about submission. It's almost like as soon as we say that word, it's you know, that resistance because it's something not natural. It's everything supernatural. To submit is by a choice that we, pay, that we make. Not because we are obligated to in that sense, but we have an obligation to the Lord to be obedient. And in this issue, we all submit to someone or to something. That just always happens. And we begin to take a look at the union. We take a look at the Father. And, and then under the Father, because we... We know about one God and three persons. So we have God the Father, then we have God the Son. They're connected. Then you have God the Holy Spirit. They're connected. Then you have the husbands. We're connected. And we have wives. 
You know I mean? There's an authority. There's a structure of authority. You have the children. And we're all under that authority. And if we step out from that authority that God's given us, that's when the attack comes so strong. The enemy comes after those who get isolated out from the authority that God's given. But there's so much protection given to us in authority. That's why we, we submit ourselves to one another as unto the Lord. But then we talk about you ladies and why it's so important that you do that. You know, it's amazing. It's so easy. And, and this, is, uh, this is very true. My wife can outdo me in most everything. <laughs> she, can, she can drive the car better than I can. I'm even steering it. <laughs> She's, she can. She, you know, she, always, she has a lot better ideas than I do. But I've learned one thing, just there are certain things that I, I, I just sit down and listen, because the bottom line is when I make a decision, she submits to that decision. I have the final authority in my home. But you know what? I'm under the authority of Jesus, and he has the final authority over me. And what the Holy Spirit does, the Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus Christ. Of course, Jesus Christ glorified the Father. It's all bringing us all back to God through that submission of the authority that's placed over us. And when he talks about wives, you know, to submitting, even though they may be, you know, they're not the same. You know, we are not the same. Men and women are not the same. Have you haven't figured that one out yet? <laughs> We're not the same. But that's what makes it beautiful. And when we get married, he doesn't marry us because we're so much alike, because if we're like the spouse we marry, we'll compete. Who's the best? No, we're called for a life of completion. And men would never be completed without their wives. Men have always been established to do the fighting and go to the war. They've always built this way. They're, they're not conquering new territory. The women love security and they want to be at home, meet their children. But what happens if that authority structure gets mixed up somehow or other, then it messes up the whole culture of society. Why do you think we have so many problems with our teenagers today? Because the authority structure is all broken down. We're not falling in obedience to whatever God wants. You know, one of the things that happened uh, for us a few years ago, three, three years ago now, I felt for sure that God called us to go to Oregon. Of course, I graduated the University of Oregon, so I wanted to go back to Oregon, you know, the, you know, the, the beautiful state that it is, unless you're living in Grass Valley, but, uh, but I wanted to go up to Oregon. So I had a friend of mine up there, and he invited me to come on up and, and uh, do a discipleship ministry up there, and, and uh, we came up and, and served the Lord because he was kind of hurting with a huge congregation, somewhat huge, 500-some people with no leadership. So I said, yeah, I'd be glad to come up and help out. And we were up there, and, and uh, my wife was with me, and we bought a house in the hills, and I thought I'd be able to bless my wife. And, and it was one day we were climbing off the mountain, you know, and off the hills, coming down into the valley, and it was snowing. And I said, oh, it's Cindy. Isn't this marvelous? This is so wonderful. Oh, man, look at this. And she says, I hate snow. I said, I never knew that. We've been married 45 years. I never knew that. She says, Roger, we lived in Anaheim all those 45 years. It never <laughs> snowed. I said, oh. And then later on, she began to say, I was never in agreement about going. I didn't ever like it there. So that's why she started praying. And as she started praying, I got a call from down in California to come down and take on... Uh, a, actually three or four schools we had down there and to administrate those schools and so I came on down to do that and so she got her wishes we moved back into our house that we moved out of and and so she got her way by praying <laughs> and I walked I got it by obeying <laughs> but the point that I'm going to share is that because you know even guys are going to make mistakes gals I, I want you to know they're going to make thousands of mistakes but hey do not let them Falter in that. Let him, let him make those mistakes. It's not eternal, it's, you know. And, 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 and don't demean them because they're making those mistakes. You've got to help them. You're called to be the helper. And one thing is about that, being a helper, is that one of the things that's kind of unique in ministry is oftentimes the women will do things like going to a counselor or go to a pastor and getting this counsel from them. And wait a minute, what about your husband? Oh, he's not spiritual enough. Wait a minute, that has nothing... So you be spiritual. If you're spiritual, you submit to your husband unless it violates God and violates his word. And you submit and you pray and you just lift that husband up and you help them. You tell them, you go to Pastor Mike. You go, <laughs> you go to Pastor. Pastor's here. 
Pastor Todd and the other pastors. Just, you go to them and get their counsel. And let the pastors build these men up in God because that's what this ministry is all about is building and equipping the men for the work of the ministry. And you gals are taking on your responsibilities of godliness as well. I don't know if that all makes sense to you. But it, it, otherwise it becomes chaos. You get out of the order and the foundations of the home begin to be broken down rather than being strengthened. He goes on to say, do not be unwise, as I said before, as the unwise, we're talking about the issues of wives submitting to, to their husbands as to the Lord. And I will also say that if we submit to God, then we'll submit to our husbands. If we can't submit to our husbands, we don't submit to God either. We don't do that. We may think we do. Oh, well, yeah, sure I do. No, because it's matched up in revelation of who you are. There's only one person. No, there's two people that really know me. One is my God, who died for me, and the other is my wife. And I can fool a lot of other people, but I can't fool her. <laughs> but she can't fool me either. Fifty-two years we've been together, you know, and serving the Lord together. And, and so faithful in that whole commitment to one another. But to tell you about the wars we've been at throughout those years, it has always been a few wars. But God's always worked it out for good. Even in the mistake that we made when we went to Oregon, I don't know if we made a mistake. She thinks that we did. I don't think we did. But anyway, <laughs> we haven't still solved that problem yet. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, it's just great. But it's just so important that you, you definitely see that because if you take a look at authority, if you're going to fly on an airplane, and, and uh, I'm sure you wouldn't want to fly on an airplane where there's two pilots and no co-pilot. That doesn't mean the co-pilot's not any, as good as a pilot, but the authority structure is the pilot and there's the co-pilot. You know, the, the husbands are the pilot and the, women, the wives are the co-pilot. And they're the ones that give you the great advice and support and the insights. But the guy has, to, the pilot has to make, especially if it's a crucial situation, you know, of a dangerous incident that arises, you want that pilot to be an absolute charge that's going down that direction. So in, anyway, with that whole concept, you see coaches, you know, with assistant coaches. You have the opportunity to see you know, pastors with assistant pastors. You have, you know, police has authority. They're not any better than anybody else, but they've been given authority by God to carry out certain rules. And, and as we stay under those authority, it gives us that safety net that we really need and not try to buckle the authority. So crucial. And so anyway, but then, it, you know, as we see that he moves on a little bit more, that the submission does not mean inferiority. It does not mean silence. It doesn't mean that the woman's a doormat. You know, it doesn't mean that they, they're just be stepped on and open. No, they are, they are locked together just as God is. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the husband and the wife. They're in together. Christ is in them. He's put this thing together himself. And whether God joins together, you know, let not man separate. He goes on to say, in chapter number 5, verse 24. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let their wives be to their own husbands in everything. I go back in everything other than violating God, violating his word. You know, some kind of these guys can be real knuckleheads, you know. Guys, I'm just charging you. You don't be a knucklehead. You've got to be raised up. As pastor talks about being the priest of the home, you have to set the course. And sometimes you're not really sure how to do things or what to do. But God has ordained you for that. And he's equipping you for that. If you're willing, I mean, you can fight the good fight out there on the streets, but man, when it gets into the spiritual things, wow, you know, sometimes we don't know how to fight that fight against the enemy other than through his word once you get committed to the word of God and committed in obedience to whatever God's called you to do. That you'll go through the word of God and you'll hear his voice and you'll do what he wants you to do. I love Dietrich Bonhoeffer when he said, you know, I've come to know one thing, and that's spontaneous obedience. You know, spontaneous obedience. How many guys are so afraid to make a mistake, maybe lose their masculinity, or what? You know what? Make mistakes. Who cares? As long as you don't do it on purpose, the Holy Spirit will convict you of sin, of righteousness, of judgment, and pull you right back in line again. So don't be afraid. You know, that's where... That fear that comes is demonic. You know, fear is a demonic spirit. That's all there is. But he has not given you a spirit of fear or timidity, but he's given you a spirit of love, power, and a sound mind. And so rather than having fear, 
the antidote is always faith, and God will have you do things that you cannot do. And you call upon Jesus to do it. He lives inside of you, and you do it. And you go, whoa, wow, that wasn't me. And the Lord says, yeah, I told you so. I did it for you. And then you see all God doing that work in your lives, and you just rejoice in the things that God does. Giving him the honor that's due his name. But this name you gals got, you took your husband's name. Isn't it amazing in the culture we live right now how oftentimes the women, I, I, in a school, I'm, I'm operating a school in, in Downey, I have parents come in that have different last names. So I sit them down, I say, women, you guys have different last names, how come? You know, well, we're, we're really married. Well, then wait a minute, wh why do you have different last names? Is it really a submission issue? Can't you bear his name? You don't see him bear your name. The men don't bear the women's name. You know, they're supposed to bear the name, you know, of their husband. And I know there's always legal issues and things like that people try to fall into. That really bothers me, too, because ultimately you bear the name of the husband. And one of the things about doing that, wherever the man goes, the woman goes. He's called by God, whether it be a, be a pastor or if he's going to be called to do something, Gal's got to come in and help out and support it. And oftentimes there's this independency that goes on in relationships. There, the woman goes one way and the guy goes another way. And here they started out as one. And all of a sudden, where are they? And they get out there. They can't even communicate anymore because there's a spiritual division of allowing Satan to come in through the world and through flesh and to cry, you know, to cause the separation of the marriage. Three out of every four Christian marriages right now are failing. Why? You know, it's a simple principle. As you see this right here, therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, let their wives be to their own husbands. Not, you know, it doesn't tell women have to submit to every man. No, to your own husbands. That's what it calls. And, um, and so one of the neat things I know over the years, and when I was involved as, as a pastor in Southern California, I would... Um, have the opportunity to uh, counsel people before they get married. And this may sound strange. I would counsel them such a way to try to break up their, their relationship. If I could break up their relationship, God didn't put it together. And I try to cover every single, I ask the toughest questions. Are, are you sleeping together? You know, are you, you know what, what's going on? What's your problems? You know, what kind of a family background do you have? You're, you're taking two cultures and merging it into one. You know, the same thing where you're going to be raised is when you try to influence the other person. I try to cover all those rocks, you know. And if I could break them, guess what? After they get married, they don't have to worry about it. It's already been resolved before they get married. But oftentimes people say, well, take, we'll deal with it after we get married. No, that won't work. You know, it never works that way. If you resolve it with Jesus as being in the center, the foundations of their relationship, going into their marriage, that Jesus inside of the husband and Jesus inside of the woman, you don't see Jesus putting on boxing gloves and duking it out with the other person. You don't see the Jesus fighting with the other person. It's always flesh. And so the point of the matter is that, that man should become more godly, the woman should become more godly, and he pulls these things together to be that one all the way through their marriage life until they pass on and go into heaven. It's a marvelous work of God. But sometimes, you know, these issues that rise up, I don't know if Todd remembers it or not, but our son had cancer, and uh, we thought uh, um, he was going to die. They told us he was going to die. And this lady down here was so faithful, hanging in there, going through those, you know, chemotherapy treatments and radiation treatments, and, you know, thinking, man, we're not going to have our son. And I remember one night I said, you know, Lord, if you'll heal Scott, I'll do anything you want me to the rest of my life. And uh, he was miraculously healed. Uh, thank God uh, I had a chance to marry him and my assistant pastor's daughter. And they have two beautiful children, and they're doing great. But at, during that time, after he was healed, I remember kind of sitting in the fence in my Christian life, like many guys do. They'll sit the fence and just kind of... And the Lord said to Roger, either you are for me or you're against me. Either you gather or you scatter. I mean, this word became so clear of my time with him that night that I sat in the book of Matthew, and I thought, wow, Lord. And he says, I said, but I want to sit the fence, Lord. And he says, I know, but you said 
that if I would heal your son, that you would do anything I want. I want you to make a stand for me. I go, oh, man, what does that mean? Okay, I got on my face. I started crying. I started weeping. I said, I'm so scared, God. I don't know what this means, but I know that I promised you that. And I, I, I want to fulfill my promise to you. I got up that night, and at that time I was teaching at Anaheim High School and never stopped. Went on the middle of the campus and started preaching the gospel. People were getting saved. It was a, it was a phenomenal work. They tried to take me to the school board and fire me, and, and they had the Jewish Defense League after me, the, the Cardinal of the Catholic Church after me, because we have an ad on our back of our football program <laughs> that was used for Jesus. And, and, but the point that I'm trying to share is that night I made a commitment to Jesus. I made that commitment. I wasn't, I wasn't willing to go through all the way with the commitment. But God spoke to me as maybe the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, some of you men today, that maybe you will rise up and be the men that God called you to be and to set the standard, set the foundation of what's going to be in your home, set the foundation that's supposed to be here in the church and in the culture and in the society and the workplace that you work, that they would see Jesus. Wherever they turn, they would see Jesus Christ. But going back, not getting too far off track, I'm sure I'm getting far enough, but Again, in everything, just gals, be careful. I, you just uh, you don't want to get caught up in pornography, lying, stealing, drinking, all that kind of stuff. No, that's all the worldly stuff. Yeah, no. For the husband is the head of the wife. As also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Even though we're talking about marriage, you notice that he's linking the two together as the same. It's the same. Jesus is the head. Man is the head. He's the one in charge. He's the one that has that authority. I was curious one years ago. I, uh, I come from Nebraska, from the farmlands, and my mom used to take me over across the Missouri River to my aunt's farm. And we'd go on my aunt's farm, and my I remember going out in the the front yard, and she says, what about a chicken dinner, you know? And I said, yeah, we'll just have chicken dinner. And she'd walk in and grab one of these chickens. She'd grab that chicken and go, boom, and pull that head off, and that chicken would just go, boom, fly. It was all the blood went everywhere. I go, oh, man. I said, now I can realize what, what a head's supposed to be for, is to keep the whole thing together, you know? And so don't, <laughs> don't lose your head, guys. <laughs> you know, it'll go crazy. But uh, nevertheless, uh, Christ is the head. And if, if he's not the head, it just all falls apart. And so, um, again, he lays that out for us. Talk a little bit about opposites together. That's really important. Uh, husbands, love your wives. Um, am I missing something? 24. Let's go 24. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Really interesting. Husbands, the wives are supposed to submit and subject. By the way, I even wonder, you know, I don't know if this is going to be off base theologically, but you, I wonder, it's because... When women wear their earrings, could it possibly be because as bond slaves, you know, they used to pierce their ears and put earrings in their ear to show that they were a slave to their master? Is that why women you know, wear earrings? I mean, is that, I don't know, <laughs> Pastor, you're the theologian here. I just always wondered that. <laughs> <laughs> a little symbolism. I don't know. It might be true, might not be. I just throw that out there. So, anyway, uh, love your wives. Hey, hey, guys, love your wife. I mean, lay your life down for her. See, you, you, you're not supposed to do the same thing. Each one of you has something to do. But Jesus, he leaves it out here. Jesus left the example. It wasn't much fun for him to go to the cross. I mean, we go see all these movies on TV and, and the movie houses and all about this romantic love. Come on. He's not talking about this romantic love. He talks about agape love. You love your wife no matter what. If she's good or bad or indifferent, you love her anyway. That's the work of God inside of you. You make allowances for her faults. 
<laughs> my wife tried. Roger, don't tell her all of our stories, but I, I, gotta, gotta, I have to share a couple of these here with you. I do love my wife, but I hate weeding. I hate going out in the garden to weeding. But I go out in the garden to weeding and weeding because my wife loves the, no weeds in the garden. You know, I go out and fix the fence, you know, the fence post because, you know what, she wants the fix, you know, fence post fixed. Or she wants new doors in the den. So I do everything I can. I don't always give it to her right off the bat. I kind of let her wait for a while and she keeps asking a little bit. She, faced, she thinks I'm not listening to her, but I really listen to her. And I find ways that I can bless her. And she may not even know that until she sits here today to hear that. But that's why I do those things. I love this lady. I mean, she's given everything, you know. For me as a husband, she supports me completely. But you know what this neat thing about being able to love her? She has this morbid desire to be submissive. And the more submissive she is, the more she desires to really support, you know, to allow me to support her and laying down my life for her to, to do all that I can to make her happy. I even went out and bought her some, she has a bad shoulder, and I went out and yesterday and I got hot packs and cold packs, and so packing her down with, with those things, hoping that God will heal that, you know, through natural things. But, you know, you, we just do those things, right, husbands? We just do those things. Because we have one command by the Lord, and that is to lead. And, uh, but there's never, ever an excuse for anybody to be abusive to their wives, ever. You know, never do that beat down and be the dictator. It's never that way. It's always working together so closely. It's almost like, you, it's almost like you're equal, but you're not quite. It's just, there's a covering over you for the protection that the blessings would come from the Lord through the wives and to their husbands to do those things that God wants us to do. And we're not all perfect. It takes time. It's taken me 52 years, and I'm still not there. I think God's going to give me a few more years, I hope. You know, I don't know if I, I know the time I will be perfect, and that's the day that God takes me home to be with him. But nevertheless, we're all in a work in progress, doing all that we can. And if we make those mistakes, we make those things, you know, right with the Lord. If we get humbled with, by the Lord under his mighty hand, then he will straighten us out in due time. But this love oftentimes comes from the heart. It takes sacrifice. Um, if we look at Jesus, there's a song that came out, Don Francisco, years ago. And, and, and he's saying, he says, love is not a feeling, but it's the act of the will. And I never forgot that song, you know. It's not a feeling. Love is an act of the will. We love just because. I'm going to go back to Jesus Christ on the cross. You think what, what he went through for you and me. Because he loves you. I mean, he did everything when he laid his life down. All the beating, all the provoking. Everybody was yelling, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then they were saying, now crucify him, crucify him. Because he didn't do as they said he was supposed to do. Oh, terrible. The scourging. Being beat with a sack over your face. Being up on the cross. If you're God, come down from up there couldn't or you wouldn't be saved and he knew that and it cost him everything but it cost you too to live godly it cost you but it's all worth it because ultimately it brings glory to jesus to do what he says for us to do brings glory to him it's so easy for husbands to be self-centered mm selfish the wise pray for him work with him minister to him he goes on to say that he verse number 26 might sanctify or set apart to be holy and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word one thing my wife and I have done for the last 10 years is we let the word of God do its work we journal the word of God we try to do it every year, get through the journal and go start all over again through the um, one-year Bible. Matter of fact, my wife is a little ahead of me right now, about uh, maybe about a month ahead of me. And, uh, but the beautiful thing is that we begin to share all the things God shares with us. I'll be at work and I get this telephone call, Cindy, on my cell phone. 
I said, it was you. God just spoke to me, Roger. Oh, really? What was it? I think because we've been praying about this, I think he's answering us through this prayer. You know, to, what do you think about it? I think it's great. You know, this is what God wants to do. But what a great opportunity to see her in the Word of God all the time. But she also sees me in the Word of God all the time. You know, very few times do I ever miss a day to be in the Word. Because why? Because why am I going to live my life for me? No, we live our life for the Lord. And what does He want from us? Whether to sanctify us and cleanse us and wash us by the washing of the water, to convict us of sin and of righteousness, judgment, to be able to come to that place where we'd be holy before Him. That the men would bring holiness into the home and set the stage for not only their wives, but for their children. And raise their children up in the ways of the Lord, as Pastor says, so when they become old, they're not going to depart from it. It's a work. It's a, it's a priesthood. It's a holy work of God upon the lives of the men of God. For no one ever loved his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. For this reason, going all the way back to, Revela uh, to Genesis and then also in Matthew, for this mystery, and actually for this reason, the mystery is coming following, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. Be joined. Not, you're automatically joined. You be joined. It gets, gets better and better and better you walk together how can two walk together unless they be agreed how special it is for the unity there right now we're in a, my wife and i are in a major decision you know we're trying to make a, an adjustment of what we're what the lord has for us you know my wife doesn't seem to be at, at, on fire as i am so i'm waiting for her to be spoken to by the lord ultimately i still have to do what god calls me to do and i know that but, but she is very patient with me on that area. But she's a great asset because she said, God hasn't spoken to me yet. I said, well, start meeting with the Lord. We've got, we can't do this unless we're all in agreement. And she said, well, actually, it was about three or four days ago. She says, yeah, I think God's really working us this, in this direction. I said, oh, well, praise the Lord, you know. That's how the teamwork goes. You know, she's to protect, you know. I'm out there, I'm like, I'm like Peter, ready, fire, aim, you know. You know? <laughs> she's ready, aim, fire. <laughs> And so I just, you know, somehow or other, it, it, it does come together. And he goes on to say again um, here, For this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. The church was taken out of Jesus' society. The woman was taken out from Adam's side. The whole principle of this union of marriage was taken for the purpose of being one. Just like it says in John chapter 17, we be one with the Lord. That Christ in you, the hope of glory, you're in Christ. Together you're working together. Jesus is working in, through your lives. He's taking two people from two opposite ends of the earth, pulling them together to form something beautiful through hard work, through being patient, taking scriptures and submitting to the word of God to watch God do a work. And there's no failures, guys, other than not doing nothing. No such things as failing. God's not going to let you fail. If he's your Lord, he may take you out there a little while to get you back where he needs to have you to be. To bring you up grow you and teach you and mature you in the things of the Lord. If you be faithful little things, God will give you more things to be faithful with. He will. It's this relationship you have with the Lord. The reason I pull this all together today, there's a reason, significant reason, that I'm convinced, as I said in the beginning, we have turned Christianity into a religion. But what about the relationship with Jesus? What about the relationship with Jesus Christ giving you two commandments to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor? Why? Love your neighbor as you love yourself. I mean, those are things that God gives us to do. That's why he came to die and he gave it to you to carry it out. 
He gave you the great commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel in every nation, make disciples. If you be faithful with little things, he'll give you more things to be faithful with. It might be your next door neighbor. It might be the person you're working with. You know, you're all representatives of Jesus. Jesus, people running all over the place, filled with the Holy Spirit. Whoa, singing and making songs. The happiest and go lucky guy. It was amazing. I heard a story about who is it to have the, the Tim? Is Tim in here right now? But the, the asphalt guy? He's up in the youth. Well, anyway, Tim, your asphalt you know, guy here in church, I just met him up in Perth. And, and I was thinking about when I was back doing asphalt. And I was on this asphalt company because I had paid bills, medical bills. And uh, these guys were just getting out of jail and they're working on this crew. And I was laying this thing out and I'm thinking, you know, I've got to talk to them all about Jesus. And they all go, we don't want to be there with Roger. We don't want to you keep us away from him, you know. And so all the way through the summer, we're working, we're working. And then all of a sudden, you know, I think it was at 7 o'clock one night, we had a project to do. These guys crashed on me, and I was still out there just digging asphalt. And What is in you? What are you doing this for? You're making this look bad. So I don't care. We've got to get this job done with or without you. You know, I got it all done. And at the end of the summer, you know, I was the head football coach at that time. I came in for our opening football game, and that whole crew, that whole crew came to the first ball game together because of the influence of hearing about Jesus, seeing a Jesus at work in their midst. See, you're Jesus' people wherever you go. But, you know, he started home first, and you've got children, and then you have a world to tackle. Nevertheless, let each of you in particular so love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband and she respects her husband. Just take a look at it quickly. If the wives are going to be submissive, because first of all, I have to be submissive to God, right? We're talking about relationship with Jesus. And then subjecting, we all bear the name of Christian, right? So we all bear his name. Where he goes, we go. So, and then she respects her husband. And then the man, he he's to love his wife, lay his life down, die for her, to make her happy and holy and, and, and just a, a, a blessing. And all of a sudden, uh, these things begin to operate. And all of a sudden, the man feels like he's respected by the wife. Whoa, man. And then she submits to him. Whoa, man. You know? Oh, I want to die for her. And he lays it down, and I'm going to do everything I can to be a blessing to her. And then she says, no, I'm going to really respect him. Look what he's doing here. And she respects him and submits to him, and he dies for her. And you can see how the operation goes. It's not a one-time issue. It's just a whole life for each other. That's why it's happy Mother's Day today as well as happy Father's Day today because it's a mystery of Christ in the church. You know, you just be blessed by God. And when I talk about this being a, not a religion, not a religion, it's because of relationship personal with Jesus. If you've never been converted, well, I said a prayer one time, Pastor. So, is there any fruit of repentance? Have you really ever repented? I don't know. If not, you can live the old lifestyle like the world does. And unfortunately, the church is following the world's principles all the way down. But it's crucial. Of knowing to know Jesus Christ and repenting of our sins and accepting him as Lord of our life and yielding to him and being filled. That, that first filling is probably the baptism of the Holy Spirit, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, empowered by God himself to do those things that he wants us to do in the first place because it's out of relationship we have with him. I feel in these days we've got to call the church back to the foundations, build that foundation upon Jesus Christ, upon the gospel of Jesus Christ, and live for him because he died for us. And whatever it takes, and use this relationship of marriage to be the focal point that people would see what a godly marriage is in this church, or marriages, that Jesus, that Jesus be glorified. I want to pray for you today. May I do that?
after we bow our heads. Lord, I just thank you for the opportunity to, to be here today. What a blessing it is. And I just think about all the things that were discussed today. Uh, I know there was so much I wanted to say, and it didn't seem like there was enough time to cover it all. But because of the day, because you're the Father, because Jesus, you're his Son, and Holy Spirit, <laughs> you're the force that brings great comfort and help to all of us. And yet you're one God in three persons. We are one marriage in two persons. And yet we are one. Lord, I hope we can receive that today. In faith that we would receive that. There's no guilt or condemnation for those that are in Jesus. So this morning, Lord, may we come back to that first love the church at Ephesus, to come back to that first love that we may have left because of the culture we live presently. But you would just bring us to that union today. And Lord, I'm just going to do something. I, I know that uh, there's always people that come, uh, either they're not saved yet today, or Lord, that they are spiritually uh, filled with the Holy Spirit, walking in the Spirit. Yet there's some that fall into carnality, that we've accepted you, Lord, but in, in the flesh, trying to live out the life in their own wisdom and their own knowledge and, and falling so short of trying to do it on their own and finding not success. And Lord, I just want to pray for those that are here today for that. If you're a person here today that doesn't know Jesus, I'm going to ask you in a few minutes to acknowledge that. If you've never been converted, then I'm going to ask you to that. You don't have a relationship personal with Jesus that you would acknowledge that that today could be that day where the Holy Spirit would come and change things for you. Those of you that have not ever been baptized in the Holy Spirit, I'm going to ask you to do the same thing. I'm going to ask you to respond in obedience to God, that his will would be accomplished, that you receive all that God has for you and the power he wants to give you to live this life he's called you to live. So that, that being said, those of you that want to receive Jesus today or be converted to Jesus Christ today, I want you to stand right where you are today. Stand right on up. And those who want to receive the Holy Spirit today, the baptism, I want you to stand as well. I know some of you are kind of going through things in your mind. Going, oh, I know that old heart starts to move around. And, oh, I don't know. I don't want to be embarrassed today. I don't know. Jesus wants something to take place in your life today. If you're bold enough to take a stand with him, I still want you to do that today. And not be embarrassed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a power of God and a salvation for all who believe. No guilt, no condemnation. I know it's a healthy church, but God, if there's anybody here that doesn't know you or who are in carnal, that's living in the flesh, even if they're Christians, they, they, they're living in the flesh. They would just stand and get things right today for you. I want to pray for them. So, Lord, I thank you for the privilege of being here today. I thank you, Lord, for the healthiness of the church. Thank you for the blessing that allows me to be uh, serving you in a great congregation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Let's all stand. Let me put this pulpit at the right height. There we go. Hey, listen. You are loved of the Father, every one of you. And every one of you men today are blessed of the Father if you have a wife standing next to you. Amen? And it's Father's Day, and your quiver may be full. If you've got children, that's what the Bible says, may your quiver be full, but your arrows, and you're blessed. Amen? This man here is really blessed. 
Even late in life, he's having more arrows manufactured. So, <laughs> Pastor Todd. But I want to pray for you before you leave. And listen, we, we, you know, we, have a, we had a little present for the ladies on Mother's Day. We got a present for you men on Father's Day, which is all those donuts out there. And all of those donuts have to be eaten because if they don't, then they got to go home with the two retired cops that are in our church. Uh, Ruski and Gary will be taking home all of the donuts that you men don't eat because, you know, cops need donuts. That's just the way it works. So, <laughs> hey, let's pray. Father, we love you. And this uh, July, I will have been married for 40 years, and I love my wife. And she loves me. And we love you together. And we love serving you, Father. We love serving this church. It's never been a burden for us. It can get crazy around here and, you know, it can just be so busy. But, Lord, we love these people. We love the men, the fathers. We love the wives and the mothers in this church, the children. And we ask just a great blessing today as they spend time together honoring fatherhood today. And uh, Lord, I just pray that you would curse every calorie in those donuts and uh, turn them into protein, Lord, we pray. In the mighty name of Jesus and all God's sons and daughters would say, amen, amen. amen. God bless you guys. You're just missed the fellowship and make sure that there's not one donut left. I don't need them. <laughs>